All right. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, my talk is going to take on obviously a slightly different tack today. I'm going to be looking at some of the eccentric training and um, trying to understand how we can progress the loading, etc. Because I think that's one of the problems that we have. Um, similar to PRP, um, eccentrics and eccentrics are not exactly the same thing. I think we need to have a look at how we're loading, what exercises we're using, and how to try and get the uh, best effect from that. So. Um, <coughs> But before I do that, um, again, to the organisers, thank you very, very much for inviting me to this very prestigious Congress. I think it's been an, um, a huge success, and long may it continue. And good luck in the future. Thank you, Stefan. Right. So, um, the topic really is that eccentrics is more than just strengthening. So, if we have a look at the literature and what's available for eccentrics, we, we know that a lot of it's covered uh, tendinopathy, particularly with the Achilles tendon, that has then um, also been introduced into hamstrings, both for the prevention of the strain as well as the, um, the rehab following a, an injury to the hamstring muscle. What's also probably less known is that there are studies out uh, looking at post-ACL reconstruction. I'll go through a little bit of that where they do it. They introduce eccentrics relatively early on, um, as well as uh, total knee arthroscopy. So as you can see, there's a, it's a cornerstone for a lot of um, rehab protocols. And I think it's uh, for those involved in rehabilitation, as well as the surgeons um, designing rehab protocols, we need to know and understand a little bit more about eccentrics. Okay, so just um, very quickly, some of the differences between eccentric and concentric contractions as far as training is concerned and what the benefits may be when we're looking at de de designing specific rehab protocols. And the first we know, and there's certainly enough evidence to suggest, that there's less oxygen consumption um, utilized when you do an eccentric contraction, which is, I'll go through is wh wh what the benefits to the tendons are. Uh, there's certainly greater force production um, available in an eccentric contraction, um, and also that there's less energy expenditure. And the advantage of that is that if we have a look in the, in the tendon, for example, that we know that the oxygen consumption um, in a tendon is a lot, lot lower than that in the muscle, and there's a good reason for that. Um, is because these tendons have to carry um, high loads or loads and keep under tension for long, long periods of time. So we really need to start looking at rehab protocols that um, uh, use techniques that don't have a high energy consumption demand. On um, some of the effects of, of eccentric training, we know that it will decrease your, your pain and, uh, and increase your performance. And, and that can be visualized on the MRI scan where they've had a look at the actual tendon volume will decrease after eccentric loading, as well as the intertendinous signal will change and it will improve. Um, and what the belief is there that your type 1 collagen synthesis is stimulated and enhanced through the use of um, eccentric training. One of the problems that um, I'm going to put out today and I think we need to have a look at is a lot of the, or some of the literature suggested that the use of eccentrics in competition is not beneficial. And there was a study on the elite volleyball players that had a look at that and found that there was no benefit after 12 weeks. Uh, those that are involved in elite sports, um, particularly in football, you'll realize that our off-season is very short. So trying to take these players out of competition is almost not a time when it is. So we need to start looking at protocols, at, at ways in which we can do um, training while these players are still in competition. Uh, perceived exertion, ratings of perceived exertion appears to be a better uh, way of uh, controlling an, or exercise prescription than using your one rep max. Um, and there's been suggestions as well that it's certainly as effective as surgery and sometimes even sclerosing injections. Now I think um, it shouldn't be a case of one versus the other, it may just be an algorithm that's developed that the eccentric training like uh, Alfredson suggests should be commenced first. If that doesn't work then you may progress on to others. And I think in the elite football environment, you may even combine some of the techniques together to get uh, quicker results. Have a look at a couple of the, the models that were traditionally out in tendinopathy. And the, and the first classical um, model was looking at the inflammatory stages where it was initially thought there was inflammation leading to tendinitis. That might be in the early phase where there's some reactive inflammatory process going on. Um, then leading to some collagen separation or tears um, within the tendon and that would then suggest that the pain fibers are mainly situated within the tendon collagen. Um, and the implication of that then, that we need to uh, develop some way to repair that tendon um, in order for us to decrease the pain. So that was the initial cl uh, classical model. 
we've now sort of subsequently moved on to more of the biochemical contemporary type of models where they're trying to identify these irritants, these biochemical irritants that may be causing the pain or stimulating pain because I think as some of the speakers have already alluded to in anterior knee pain and as in patellar pain, we're not 100% sure where the pain is arising from. So, but what they, they do uh, seem to think is that there's significant pain receptors in the tissues that surround the patellar tendon, particularly in the fat pad, it's, it's richly innervated, the synovium, even the periosteum. So there's certainly a lot of, of area where those noise receptors are present, and if you get these biochemical irritants, they can go into that area and cause pain. So the implications, therefore, is that uh, tendon repair is a method, certainly, to decrease these toxins from being um, uh, traveling into the surrounding areas. And also the denervation of nociceptors, and perhaps that's why these um, high stripping injections using saline, using PRP, using other things work, um, because they have one simple uh, or, or common denominator, is that they may denervate the area, as well as um, other techniques of surgery where they go and they denervate, and they separate, and what has been thought is that there's an adherent fat pad uh, that sticks to the back of your patella tendon, and that causes part of the irritation. Okay, so look at what we're aiming is we wanted to try and modify the stimulus as biochemical stimulus, and we need to find um, ways in which we can do that. One is you can do a repair of the collagen or improve the state of it, either through surgery or um, with the use of eccentric training. Uh, reduce this irritant, and that's not necessarily inflammatory. Um, there could either be pain, the glutamate, things that are present. They're looking at, at substances and chemicals that may be able to reduce that. The denervation through surgery is a technique that we've used fairly often. Again, I think in a footballer, you're trying to reduce the pain, which then allows him to go and proceed on to exercising. And that was done in 2000 with Khan, Cook, Mafuli, and others. Okay, um, this is a, a case study of ours where one of our athletes developed a fairly uh, severe anterior knee pain, patella tendon pain. Um, he was seen by a specialist, and uh, those are just ultrasound uh, views. We've, we've shown earlier the neovascularization, the higher signal on the left, um, and two days later, post PRP injection, uh, you can see that that signal is rapidly reduced. That coincided with a, a significant reduction in the, in, the, in the footballer's pain, which then allows us to start contemplating other forms of rehab, where prior to that, we certainly weren't in a position, and if we needed to rest them, it was going to take a long time to rest and coming to the end of the season, and unfortunately, given our current results, we didn't have that luxury. Other ways of looking at things, you can have a look at um, MRI scanning, um, and there are ways, and this is a, um, the, the same player, in fact, that uh, was highlighted with that ultrasound scan, and that was on his pre-signing um, medical. You can see there's, uh, there was an asymptomatic uh, um, lesion in his patella tendon. He had no patella pain at that stage, and then um, more recently, when he developed the pain, that has moved on to pain. So there's even in three or four years ago, he was clearly having some abnormal collagen, um, and whether or not that has ultimately uh, culminated in this problem, we're not sure. The use of eccentrics in the ultrasound uh, as a way of um, gauging whether or not you're getting improvement, and you can see that pre-eccentrics, you've got a fairly thickened tendon, um, the hyperechoic uh, areas within that tendon, you can see the collagen is, is not as well aligned as in the, the image lower down, where you see that uh, post-eccentric training, you certainly get a reduction in the volume and uh, the tendon looks a lot healthier in the collagen alignment. Another interesting way, is some researchers are looking at tendon changes, where they then uh, uh, use the, the tendon and they measure the volume in the tendon pre-eccentrics, and they can also look at the tendon changes. So that's a seed uh, growing technique that they have um, in order to look at the, the intensity signal changes, which I think, as is alluded earlier, the ultrasound is pretty user-dependent. So if we wanted to be a little bit more accurate, I think there are techniques available to start having a look at changes in volume. I think now we need to understand the various types of eccentric training protocols that have been out there. And it all started with Stanish and Kerwin, uh, where they did a, a simple drop squat um, as part of their eccentric training program. Um, and the main features of this program is one is that you go through the concentric and the eccentric phase. So uh, we'll go into the Alfredson program later, but you'll see the differences. And with this protocol, the eccentric phase is in the lowering, they drop, they drop, they increase the speed of that dropping movement. So it's a, it's a rapid downward movement and then a slow concentric up phase. What they suggest is that there's, um, you do it once a day for seven days a week uh, for the first six weeks and then three times a week um, after the six-week period and they do three to ten repetitions. 
What's interesting here is they control the pain and how they modulate the, um, the loading is that in the third set, between the 20th and 30 rep, if you're feeling pain that is similar to what you experience in activity, they feel that's an ideal load. If you feel no pain between the 20th and the 30th rep, then you can increase the load or increase the speed. And what they normally do is they increase speed before load. Um, if, the, however, the pain is experienced in the, the second set or even the first set, then your load or your speed is too quick and you need to modify it accordingly. Alfredson then went on and, and they modified their, um, their program because, as we know, it was basically on the Achilles tendon. And they had a look at uh, the single leg decline squat. And with that, there was no warm-up, um, eccentric phase only. So as they would lower down, they would do a passive concentric phase where the asymptomatic leg would then uh, return them back into the starting position. Um, with this one, they were encouraged to work through pain um, unless uh, the pain became disabling. So that's, again, a slight difference between the Spanish protocol. Um, their progression is that they recommended that it's a 4 to 5 on the pain scale, where if you're going below that and they're only reporting a 3 to 4 uh, on the pain scale, you need to increase the load, whereas if it was 6 to 7, then you can decrease it. And, and with this protocol, the Alfreds, and they were recommending twice a day. So, again, we're getting a lot of disparity between how often you should be doing it and... Um, whether you should be doing eccentrics and concentrics together. This study had a look at uh, very high overloading of the tendon and the, the Brosman device with 320 kilograms of a loaded squat and there's obviously it assists you coming back up. So they will only do the eccentric phase of that. They train twice a week and they compared it to that uh, single leg decline um, board one. And it was interesting that both had um, good results or equal or similar results so again, suggesting that we're not quite sure what the optimum dosage um, uh, of, of loading should be at this stage. It went further and looking at some off-season rehab, comparing the decline to the STEP protocol, where you can see that the, uh, there was a decline board introduced and the other one was more traditional, just a step down. Both showed um, good scores. The, 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 the function and the pain um, improved in, in both the STEP and in the decline squat, so there was no real difference between the two. But what they did find is that the likelihood of success is greater in those that do decline squats compared that to those that do the step squat. So again, if you're going to, their recommendation is use a decline squat, it's going to produce similar results um, to just a step off, but the likelihood of, of a success is ultimately going to be improved. <laughs> so the recommendations coming out of Lorenz in 2011 is that they now have gone to four sets of 6 to 12 repetitions. Uh, and they only do that three to four times a week, which is, again, is a lot more manageable, and it'll improve your compliance um, with the athletes in that program. They also use pain monitoring as a way to control it. They, they'll do, again, it's, it's, it's going to be whether or not they experience pain in, in that, and if they're, they're experiencing pain, they'll, they'll need to um, increase them. Two to three on the pain scale is too low, whereas four to five, again, is ideal, and six to seven is too much. What they do, though, is that they will gradually increase the number of reps. So they start at repetition number six and then gradually work up to 12. Once you can do four sets of 12, they'll then increase the load. And you start down at six and you gradually work your way up again. Just briefly on hamstrings, um, uh, it's not part of the talk, but it's again, it just gives us some insight into the benefit of, of eccentrics. And, and what it, the real take-home point there is that what eccentrics does, it'll, it'll adapt by changing the optimal length of the muscle, and that's what we believe gives it some protection. So whether that's for the quadriceps with the tendon, it will change the optimum angle at which you produce torque, and that's believed to, to help. The traditional lowering um, is now, uh, with the Nordic load, is, is looked at maybe not the, the most um, effective way of exercising, and they're looking at doing more... Um, closed chain exercises such as um, uh, uh, lunges, etc. Rehab, um, also that what's come out of the studies is that we should be doing our preventative work post-training when they're in a fatigued state rather than pre-training. Anterior cruciate ligament reconstruction, as I said earlier, those were two types of ergometers that we had a look at, and that was introduced uh, three weeks post-exercise, and they found to have very beneficial effects on the, the size of the the muscle post this program. You can see they started very early on, uh, three weeks, and at a very, very light um, perceived exertion. Uh, they started at five minutes, and after 12 weeks, they then progressed on to, to a total of 30 minutes. In the black line, you can see that the semitendinosis, um, as well as the biceps in the, the quadriceps and the gluteus maximus, they're in black, 
were significantly better than those that underwent a standard rehab protocol that did not include eccentric training, and that's the grey bar. So those, the quadriceps are the group of, that just underwent a routine ACL uh, reconstruction. They took MRI um, views of the, the, the muscle, and again, they found that, that pre-training, this is in a semi-tendinosis uh, gracilis repair, is that the, uh, compared to the post-eccentric training, that there was a significant increase in the quadricep uh, volume, but as we'd expect, that the gracilis and the semi-tendinosis had in fact uh, shrunk. But because this was done in ERGA and they didn't do eccentric hamstrings, I'm not sure what the effect would have been done if they included that. This is a, a, a recumbent eccentric stepping machine, and that was used fairly early on in total knee surgery, and again with very similar results. And um, what was interesting is they recorded the pain and the, both in the muscle and the knee during this uh, rehab phase, and they found that the scores were very low. So it's something that can be introduced into your rehab. Uh, what I'd like to do is now to show you something that I think is fairly revolutionary. It's um, been developed by a South African um, colleague of mine, um, um, Willem van der Merwe, who some of the orthopedic surgeons may well know. And uh, he's come up with something that he thinks is going to make eccentrics a lot, lot easier for us. And um, so just have a look at the video. What it does is they've developed a bicycle that uh, can provide eccentric training both in a forward uh, motion as well in a backward motion. Um, so you can control, which is part of the problem, the velocity, the, the speed at which they're doing the eccentric training. You can, uh, it weighs the, the individual. Each left and right pedal will give you a, a, um, a force output. Okay. So basically on their protocol, they've total exercise time, 15 to 35 minutes. They only exercise to the onset of pain. Um, they have a functional torque value that they work out, which is calculated um, by your body weight times 9.8 times 0 0.175. So they have a formula in which they can try and calculate the starting uh, load, and that's 15 to 20% of that calculation. Again, a similar type of protocol where they will then include um, eccentrics and the bicycle will do concentric as well. You can go in a forward and backward direction. They are able to then generate graphs uh, from the cycle where you can then see the load on the left and the right pedal. And what they believe that any sh uh, change in that graph of about 10% is uh, indicative of pathology. And through training, they believe that they can correct those changes. Right, so the, the take-home message is really is that I think eccentric training should form an integral part of your rehabilitation of, of more than just uh, hamstring strains or patella tendons. Uh, the evidence to support um, is both in prevention and in rehabilitation. And you, I believe that you should work into minimal or moderate discomfort and that the progressions that you need to consider is uh, starting from a slow to a fast movement, body weight to external loading, uh, inner to mid uh, and, and then f to end range movement as you progress through the, the rehab protocol. Use pain scales as a pain monitoring device uh, daily uh, to once or twice a week, um, and that you need to try and modify. The active versus inactive is part of the problem that we are faced with, and I think that's what I said, perhaps using things like uh, injections or early stripping of some of these tendons and then getting them back into train. We are still able to, within the season, get these players back into competitive football. All right. So thank you very much for your attention, and enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you.